biomechanics side. Um, we'll have uh, hopefully plenty of uh, critical commentary for you, Dave, at the end of your talk. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So go ahead. Yeah, that was uh, quite a good timing, I guess, or bad timing, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, so today I'll be uh, discussing wearable activity trackers uh, in orthopedics. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that the uh, cost data that I'll present is based on 2018 uh, values. This is a rapidly evolving field and uh, in about 15 minutes it's hard to do a full comprehensive review so I do not pretend to do that. Um, so an activity tracker in general is a broad term uh, where it is worn, which type of data it collects, how it records data vary greatly between uh, the different activity tracker categories. There's a big difference in the commercial use, like what we think of with Apple Watches or Garmin's and what is used in uh, research. Currently it is estimated that about 21% of the population owns an activity tracker. And of these commercially available types, 95% are worn on the wrist. As we will see, this is very different than what is used in the research world. Uh, the use uh, in research, um, in the research world in general is blossoming um, with more and more studies each year utilizing some sort of activity tracker as you can see from some of the NIH uh, funding statistics here. The mere act of wearing one has been found to increase people's overall activity levels and aid in uh, chronic disease management. Um, there are four basic categories uh, that activity trackers fall into, pedometers, accelerometers, heart rate monitors, and combination products, and we'll go through each here. The pedometer is the most simple and inexpensive and it has the longest track record in research. It is worn in the central axis of the patient, uh, typically around the waist or belt, as you can see depicted here. Uh, they are uniaxial, meaning they only detect, de detect acceleration in a single plane. In this case, the vertical plane and each vertical oscillation of the hip triggers a mechanical sensor to record a step. Benefits of the pedometer include its costs, the fact that there's no protected health information stored, but drawbacks uh, include its inaccuracies at low rates of speed, uh, like walking speed, and um, it can be inaccurate in people using assistance devices for ambulation. Uh, accelerometers uh, are a step up. They measure acceleration triaxially, which allows for more types of activities to be detected and metabolic cost estimates to be generated when patient or user specific factors are input like age, sex, height, weight. Um, these two are generally worn on the waist or via a chest strap on the central axis. Um, they are slightly more expensive, but I have a growing use in research based on its improved data generated to cost ratio. And the CS, um, CSA actigraph is the most widely used in research. Uh, and there's heart rate monitors, which do just that. Um, and uh, these are kind of a completely different field of data generation. They're better at measuring metabolic costs at different levels of activity. Uh, additionally, heart rate monitors include the ability to store its own data, which makes data retrieval easier. The basic type is more on, as a chest strap as depicted in the lower image here. Uh, it detects heart rate of uh, um, heart electrical signal via two electrodes. The cost of one step is not equal for all patients. That's why a heart rate monitor can be a better calculator of energy expenditure. And the Polar Electro Company is the most widely used in medical field and research field. They have validated alternatives to EKG and uh, halter monitors. But as you can see, the, the price for these is a slight step up. The combination products are less widely used in research uh, due to validity, uh, patient healthcare concern, uh, healthcare information concerns, and reliability. Uh, but they're more commonly what we think of in the commercial design. These combinations include heart rate monitoring, accelerometers via gyroscopes, and possible other physiologic sensors. Um, they can be worn in a variety of body locations, have their own mobile applications for data display, uh, but have the least amount of published literature on them. The question that I had coming in is, is why aren't 
combination products like the risk-based activity trackers, the standard and research. Uh, They're easy to use, they have clean outputs and are reasonably priced. Uh, and the answer, as I briefly noted, is in the reliability. Um, central monitors, uh, worn on the chest or waist, are simply much better in terms of data accuracy when compared to the peripheral monitors, like those worn on the wrist or the ankle. One problem that has come up um, with uh, accuracy in research is the ability to detect uh, steps at low rates of walking speed, um, which is very device dependent. As you can see here, the Apple Watch actually does a poor job of this versus the Garmin and Fitbit devices. Uh, there's currently limited data in the use of these devices with uh, assistant, uh, assistance devices for ambulation, which hinder some, may hinder some of the orthopedic uses. Most of the research that has been um, published uh, are on validity-based studies looking at specific types of activity trackers. When looking at the entire body of research, the public uh, the published studies in orthopedic is relatively low. Uh, current applications for orthopedics are as followed. Most commonly to determine the post-op treatment trajectory of a specific injury or surgery. For example, how quickly are patients meeting their preoperative function after like a total knee arthroplasty? An interesting application will be how they can replace formal gate labs. Uh, instead of measuring mobility, like in our mobility toolkit used in the trauma world, these devices are better at free living analysis, like how people are truly doing in their day-to-day -day lives, not just an in-lab test. Their interrelationship with patient reported outcomes is an ob objective measure to correlate with subjective patient scores will be interesting. Um, their measurements may allow us to detect complications sooner by detecting a dip in patient activity. Um, by detecting normal loads uh, that the um, body is subjected to, we may be able to better extrapolate this to our cyclic loading in vitro studies. An exciting new development that I'll discuss further is how it's being used in sports medicine. Um, and you know, as we've seen recently with COVID stuff, uh, this may have an impact on how we uh, work with telemedicine in the future. So this telemedicine-based approach with activity trackers has been successfully utilized in the general oncology liter literature to monitor patient activity levels and aid clinicians in guiding patient decisions. This is a potential for us uh, to reduce the number of office visits a patient may have to undergo. For example, if they're hitting specific activity-based metrics, like the number of steps or distance traveled per day on foot with a, after a total hip, for instance, we know that these patients are doing well and they may not necessarily need another visit. Likewise, as noted before, a decrease or decline in activity may detect a need for more physical therapy or a possible complication. Uh, if we have data on what a normal uh, patient trajectory is uh, and data on what has been shown to be successful, we could give uh, patients specific metrics to hit. And physical therapists could also use this uh, to monitor their patients from afar. So I'd like to highlight a few studies and a few uses in orthopedics. Um, there are two spine studies, which I'd like to highlight as an example. This uh, first one is at a Korea using Fitbit monitoring in patients following lumbar laminectomy to, uh, to monitor activity uh, and correlate it with patient reported outcomes. They found that the mean number of steps uh, taken postoperatively was negatively correlated with VAS pain scores and positively co correlated with ODIs, uh, meaning that the patients who were more active have better functional scores and less pain, which I think we can agree is intuitive. Uh, the second study looked at both cervical and spinal operative pathologies in 30 patients um, using an accelerometer. They recorded preoperative step count and uh, compared to this to their postoperative course and you can see a gradual upward trajectory as the weeks increased. Uh, just like has been found with patient reported outcomes, patients with depression had lower functional scores postoperatively and had slower overall postoperative trajectory. 
There are uh, two recent on and ongoing com um, studies in the total joint literature. The first one here was a RCT of 163 patients undergoing total joint arthroplasty. They measured uh, patient, patients preoperatively for two weeks at, at baseline. Um, they then divided the patients into two groups. The first group uh, could see their daily data in step count and was given a step count goal while the second group was not given any sort of feedback and could not see their step count. The patients who received the feedback from their device and had goals showed significantly higher activity levels at all time points postoperatively. Uh, this would have the potential to accelerate patient rehab without any addition, additional physician or physical therapy input. There's currently a randomized control trial uh, going on between with Zimmer and a collaboration with a new Apple Watch platform called My Mobility. They are following total joint patients uh, longitudinally with the aim to use the watch as a motivational tool in the rehab process. From this data, we'll also be able to uh, define normal post-operative trajectories and possible trajectories uh, for patients with complications. As I mentioned before, free living activity analysis may be a better tool that um, in-person based metrics like the time get up and go test uh, are not maybe that great at measuring. Uh, the accelerometers have the ability to generate gait analysis data without the use of optical sensors. You can collect data like walking speed, cadence, stride length, among others. The development of gait analysis in real life conditions like on uneven terrain can provide us with insights regarding the quality of gait that the, the traditional um, in lab based tests simply can't measure. Um, studies have used activity trackers and their protocols uh, to measure postoperative functional data are finding the data to be more objective and reliable to, uh, than patient reported outcome measures. Similar to computer adapted testing, there may also be less of a ceiling effect. In vitro studies are using postoperative mobility data to estimate loads that a construct would need to tolerate with early mobilization and can apply this to their cyclic loading conditions. Here are two foot and ankle tendon based studies that have looked at just that using uh, data that has been gleaned from uh, activity tracker studies. The use in sports is an exciting, rapidly evolving uh, use in orthopedics and sports medicine in general. I'd like to thank uh, Norm Waldrip, uh, one of the phys uh, physicians at Alabama, uh, who was a big resource in putting together these slides for me. Uh, at Alabama and across many of the pro and collegiate levels, GP GPS and accelerometer data is being constantly collected on all their players and output metrics include peak velocity and change of direction speeds, as well as a host of many others like total distance travel and total steps taken at practice, et cetera. Uh, these are worn on their shoulder pads as kind of depicted uh, above. Um, and this allows the team to manage uh, player load in a new way and also guide post-injury rehab and return to sport. Uh, Dr. Waldrop and the Alabama team uh, noted a decrease in the amount of soft tissue injuries like quad and hamstring pulls when they began using this data to manage their players' load. Um, this graphic here uh, uh, showed the data from a patient before and after an injury where the vertical axis represents um, peak velocities and deceleration speeds and the horizontal axis uh, shows side-to-side -side accelerations. The larger green and gray diamond is representative of um, the patient's uh, pre-left uh, ankle injury, and then the inner diamond, red and gray, is a patient uh, immediately after a uh, injury. As you can see, the, his peak deceleration uh, decreased, and this was a left ankle injury, so his right side of the accelerations were markedly decreased. <clears throat> uh, and then this lower graphic, you can see um, the patient pre-injury velocity and distance traveled, and then following the injury, uh, you can see that the de uh, peak acceleration distance travel decreased and then increased in the post-operative or post-injury period. And uh, we could use this data uh, to potentially guide when a patient 
athletes um, can success, successfully return to sport. Um, there are a ton of devices currently being used in the literature and we need to further studies showing us which are the most reliable without industry funding. This will be helpful when we are comparing study to study uh, with different activity trackers. Uh, there are limited studies currently in the pediatric population and we don't know how this will correlate with their patient reported outcomes. As I highlighted, I think these devices are a huge potential future application in telemedicine, especially in tertiary referral centers like ours, where patients may travel from, uh, from very far. I could also imagine this being useful in the workers' compensation world to get a better idea of how patients are uh, functioning in free living conditions uh, versus you know, a functional capacity examination. Uh, one major thing that will need to be addressed is how to manage protected health information. Many of the commercially available devices require the users uh, to accept data sharing agreements, including personal information, uh, and this is usually uh, unknowing to us. That concludes uh, my talk and I'll open it up for discussion. Thanks, Dave. That's great. Um, nice to see a, uh, a virtual cameo from uh, Dr. Uh, Waldrop, one of our alumni. Um, so if everybody could uh, pop their cameras back on and um, we will uh, look for some comments. Um, you know, would certainly love to hear from uh, Dr. Sell and Ryan uh, and any of our uh, other clinicians who have uh, used various uh, wearables in, in some of their research. Certainly this is uh, an evolving area of uh, of interest in research um, with unlimited potential. I'll start. Uh, so that was a really good um, overview of uh, sensors and activity trackers. Um, and it is, it is, it's been an emerging field for probably the last three years. And there, there are a lot of issues with reliability and validity um, that we, we, we have to understand. Um, but the, the idea, you know, over the last two or three months, the, the emergence and the, the necessity of telemedicine, I think is going to drive some of these capabilities and, and, and usage. Um, but we, there's just a lot of caution about how we use these data um, with regard to um, care and treatment. But it's, 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 it can be very valuable, um, especially in sports medicine research where we're looking at, um, you know, how much time are they up and moving? Um, compared to uh, patient reported outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of concern about um, when someone has ACL reconstruction and they're returning to sport and returning to competition, um, are they loading enough? Um, in sports medicine research, there's the acute to chronic workload ratio, which has gotten so much attention uh, across, across the world from rugby to uh, um, uh, and other sports, but there's a lot of issues with that, that workload ratio. There's a publication out looking at the kind of data analysis techniques and, and, the, and the issues related uh, to that. Um, but I, this is an emerging field that I think will be very valuable in the months and years to come relative to return to sport, return to competition, and recovery and rehabilitation. So, um, Dave, that's a great talk. Um, Norm Waldrop is working closely with Lyle Kane, and Lyle's been under a lot of pressure there from a coach that you may have heard of, who is re relatively skeptical about medical evaluations. He feels like his return to play criteria, which is that after four months, you should be able to play after an ACL is there. So Lyle has actually been able to use the graphics that came out of Catapult to, that I think Norm was involved in to show um, saving why somebody's not quite ready to play yet. And I know Pat Connor probably deals with these same pressures with um, with our coaching staff. So Pat, maybe you have some experience like Lyle's and how to use these things to fend off some of these um, coaches that that think they know when they're ready to go. Well, I think I think uh, it's really a uh, an interesting and uh, exploding market. The whole the whole concept of sports science, and this is kind of in the very center of that. Dave, great great job with your review. I would say not only is the uh, accuracy of these really important, uh, but also we got to get a ton of normative data and, and, and a ton of baseline data to know what's important numbers, what's not important numbers, uh, and, tr and try to work through that. I, I, I will say anecdotally, uh, pretty much every NFL team, I believe, has used these the last few years. 
uh, in their practices and, and trying to learn more and more. Uh, many are using during the games. Uh, but there was one, one team in particular that is very vocal about not using them happens to be the Kansas City Chiefs, who won the Super Bowl last year. So, so whether or not they're critical or important over time, I think time will tell. Uh, but it, uh, it, it, it's an interesting ride. It, it will be an interesting ride. Dave, one, one thing that's coming that we're excited about is, um, is smart braces. So they're putting these sensors in and the braces that are being used for rehab. And this, these are particularly helpful as insurance companies are cutting back on allowed visits. And some of these folks that we do, the bone tendon bone grafts on that tend to get stiff, you know, you can get a readout to your, your therapist, your athletic trainer, or yourself, your PA, whoever's following your patients the closest um, with alarms set the way you want them to be. So we're excited to try that. I know Pat's, um, Pat and Jim Plashley and Dana are going to be working on the beta testing of that product. But um, one thing that's coming that's along the lines of the wearables. Yeah, and I, I would add to Dr. Mormon's um, comments regarding that. Our colleague at Duke, uh, Dr. Bill Garrett, did a lot of work with bracing um, and in, in, in installing accelerometers in the braces uh, to look at return to sport following ACL reconstruction and, and looking at kinematics and loading and actually just usage of the brace. So is the patient wearing the brace when they're supposed to um, or, or are they not wearing the brace? And then eventually the, the idea would be um, if it's a return to sport brace and a brace they want to wear during competition, um, what can we learn about um, in-game kinematics and loading? Great. All right. Well, we are, uh, any last questions? Looking for any hands raised or comments? Um, Dave, great, uh, great talk, great uh, emerging technology that we're uh, all, I think, hopefully going to be at the uh, leading edge of uh, this nationally and maybe even internationally and in how we use this. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining in today. It was uh, some great discussions. It's, uh, it's definitely nice to see everybody's faces up on the uh, same computer. Almost makes it feel like we're in the same room. Uh, we will look forward to... Um, our next grand rounds with all of us together on a Thursday morning again is going to be in two weeks. And on that day, we're going to be hearing from our sports and foot and ankle fellows as they do their end of year research presentations. Um, we're getting that uh, agenda together and we'll look forward to uh, hearing from all of them on that day. Uh, and again, if, uh, if you will receive a, an email this week telling you where to be if uh, for the pictures, um, don't feel excluded. It is primarily going to be uh, residents uh, with a focus on the chief residents. We're still working on uh, logistics and legalities in that regard. So thanks to everybody again. Look forward to uh, all of this. Um, hope everybody has a, a good work day and uh, subsequently a nice uh, relaxing weekend this weekend. So thanks to everyone and um, take care. Residents, jump on the other Zoom call for me, okay? Yes. Thanks, Brian. Sorry.